is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering The Rogue, chapters 18, 19, and 20. On the Hunt, Escapee, and No Return. In these chapters, thank God for Anyi. She shows up, she manages to get Lilia to make a decent decision for the first time in a minute. And I am really, really hoping that Lilia winds up in a position to do some good here. Oh, fuck Naki for real. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Uh, Thank you very much to Ashley for commissioning this episode. Ashley is in the chat right now and she says, it's okay. Gave me a bit of extra time to book more episodes. Yeah, I just got three pop-ups that you booked three more episodes in a row. Thank you for that, ma'am. So yeah, these chapters, man, I just can't get over how much more invested I am in this book than in the last one. It's really remarkable considering that it's almost all the same characters, Lilia being the one new addition. But I will say her story is the one that I'm the most interested in. Um, And I think that out of everybody to a point, the reason for that is that Lilia seems to have the most distinct personality because she is very naive and trusting and just kind of you know, wants to see the best in everybody. And she's so young. She feels really young. And because of that, she just feels more distinctive than everyone else. Daniel and Lorcan have a pretty similar feel to them, even though the, like the only distinguishing features being that Daniel is more reserved. Lorcan is obviously much more of a horn dog than Daniel is. Um, But the way that their minds work and the way that Sania's minds work all feel pretty similar. And I think this is the the problem that sometimes can happen. I've, I've mentioned in the very first books of this series, how much I appreciated that Sunia and Rothen, when they begin communicating and she doesn't trust him, she asks the right questions and he gives her logical answers in an effort to make her feel better. And sometimes it doesn't work for reasons that he couldn't understand, but he does his best. And he does, in my opinion, from the point of view of a reader, what I would have wanted him to do. But if you have all of your characters act in really logical and reasonable ways, and you don't vary that at all, you do run in, there's the danger of, all of your characters feeling a little bit too similar. So it's one of those like, you know, oh, I got what I wanted and everybody's doing the smart thing, but everybody can't do the smart thing. A, that's just not how people work, like period. And B, that does not make for an interesting story because mostly you do the right thing and you manage to find a solution to things, even if it's not an ideal solution. Um, So you have to put some people in there who either are not logical or who are motivated by things very different than the other characters are. And as of right now, most everyone's motivations have been the good of Kirelia, kind of like in this vague sense. And I like that Lilia's is a very different situation. Kirelia in general is really, it's not like she doesn't consider it at all, especially because of the fact that she's involved with black magic now, she knows that that's a factor. But for her, it's purely personal, really, her goals here. And that just gives her a different dimension to everybody else and makes her just a little bit more interesting to read about. So I think that's part of why this book is ringing a little bit more interesting for me. The Her addition to the story has added a bit of a chaos factor that I think it really needed in order to perk everything up. Um, Ashley says, yeah, I felt the same with some of the other characters. It felt like the plot was driving them more than their actual characters, if that makes sense. Yeah, completely. But Lilia feels like a real person. Yeah. And, uh, so it's just the kind of thing that I, I, 
am tempted to have, you know, when I write things or when I'm wishing that somebody wrote something a certain way, I am tempted to have them do the thing that, quote, makes the most sense. But that's not how people are. And if if you're looking at it from a different point of view, that will seem like a different thing to different people. So to give an example of somebody who does do what's, quote, the sensible thing, but is a deeply terrible person, we can look at Walter White. Walter White, as a character, is a bad person. He is driven by ego and greed and this sort of toxic masculinity. But everything he does is in perfect service to those ends. And it all does, quote, work out to a point because he is very intelligent. It's just that what's driving him is poisonous. So we I think we might need a bad guy to be in, like thrown in the mix here, like uh, as a POV character. We we are just in the heads of so many virtuous, selfless people that it feels rather one note. And I think that maybe we need to, you know, wind up in the heads of maybe Black Magician Callan, for instance, and see what the fuck is going on with that guy. I understand not wanting to do that as an author because she probably wants to hold some of her cards close to her vest in terms of the plot and have big reveals. But big reveals when you aren't invested in the story overall just aren't going to have the same impact anyway. So you might want to sacrifice a shock moment for the good of an interesting overall arc, you know? Anyway, those are just my thoughts because I was just really reflecting on how much more interested I am right now in what's happening. And that was the main explanation that I could come up with. And I thought it was interesting because I think I've told you guys that I've occasionally when I'm finished with a book, I'll go and read some of the reviews, um, either in Audible or in Goodreads. I haven't read the reviews for this book, obviously, because I'm not done. But I'm curious to see if people are going to feel more engaged on this, because a lot of folks seem to have the same feel as I did on the last one, which is that it just felt a bit like a slog to get through. It didn't feel finished. It was very slow moving. So I wonder if she like lost many readers and it would be a shame because the second book really picks up. Um, Ashley says, maybe Regan were familiar enough with his character. And while he's good now as an adult, I could see his perspective being a good bit more interesting. That's a very interesting idea. And honestly, I know probably, like I said, she wants to keep it close to the vest on whether or not Sinia should trust Regan and what he's going through right now. The reason that he like pulls back from this investigation on Skellen is probably going to lead to some sort of surprise. But I would love to be in his head as he realizes that he may be fucked up too. like somebody who whose impulses are to be a little bit more conniving and sneaky trying to resist that urge and be better and do better. That's an interesting place to be. And that probably would be really interesting to read about, you know, because I don't have a good grip on him. He is the kind of person that feels a little bit unbelievable because he has done such an about face as an adult. And I have a hard time believing that somebody who could be as cruel as he was as a kid could be at all trustworthy now as an adult. But that's not to say that doesn't happen because I'm certain it does. It's just hard for me to believe because I have not personally seen that sort of thing firsthand. So I have an instinct to not trust him because of who he used to be. It was he was such a dramatically evil person, really, you know, he was literally trying to kill her simply because of the fact that she was lowborn. Like that was really all it was. And I am not entirely sure how, what happens to make you grow out of that kind of belief. So I would love to get a little bit of background. I think maybe that would make his character more believable if indeed he has gone through some changes and is a better person. It might feel more genuine to me if I got to see why, you know. Um, anyway, I'm 10 minutes into this and I haven't even talked about the actual chapters yet. So let's get started. So chapter 18 is uh, we basically 
we sort of uh, do a leapfrog over the actual escape that Lilia and uh, Larandra, is that her name, um, that they execute. And we go right to the meeting of all of the magicians who are discussing what the fuck happened. And it's it, it's kind of funny because like the only person who it seems to have occurred to that perhaps she has managed to fight off the blocking of her power is Sania. But Sania does not even voice that to anybody because she's just so kind of certain that either she's wrong or maybe she just doesn't want to put it in anyone's head that that's possible because I know for me, if I were in Sania's position and it had taken so long for me to sort of gain everyone's trust, I would be really loath to tell them there is yet another thing about me being a black magician for them to be afraid of. This has been the go-to like punishment when somebody acts out with black magic or with magic, period. Uh, is to block their powers. So if they find out that a black magician can get past that block, literally the only option is going to be execution. And I can deeply understand why she doesn't really want to put that in anybody's heads that that's maybe going to be their only option going forward. Like that's a terrible fucking position to be in. So yeah, as much as I'm like, I can't believe it hasn't occurred to anybody. Why would it? This is something that they would think is literally impossible based on hundreds and hundreds of years of observation. Granted, their observation has been limited, but nevertheless, and Sunia deciding to keep that shit to herself. Girl, I, I feel you. So Sunia, they, they are all basically discussing the guards, what could have happened, the fact that they, like nobody seemed to see them. There becomes like the the sort of prevalent theory that they begin to go with is that Skellen arrived to break them out and must have done so using magic. And that's why they didn't see. And yet later on, there is a report of the two of them climbing a wall and it's just the two of them. So that seems to maybe poke a hole in their theory, but then they're like, well, maybe Skellen like left them and he went to do something like who knows, but they kind of do pull back on that theory after a while. Meanwhile, guys, I cannot get over how hilarious this is. Lilia left a note for one of the guards that just says must find Naki will return by morning. Lilia, sweetie like i love it though because that is such a lilia thing to do that she you know she's just oh she's so like such a precious summer child <laughs> hey sorry i broke out but i swear i'll be right back like <laughs> i know that's what she genuinely intended to do but the fact that she would leave a note to that effect is just adorable <laughs> it's so cute <laughs> So then they're like, well, why didn't she come back? Either she was lying about intending to come back in order to buy herself some extra time, thinking we wouldn't look for her, or she was prevented from coming back. Um, obviously, they don't really know which one, but I, it didn't occur to me that maybe she, like the, the idea that she'd lie, hoping that they don't go searching for her in the hopes that she does return. I mean... I guess that's not a terrible theory. It's just the idea that somebody would trust that they won't be searched for immediately just because of their assurance they come back. It doesn't hold a lot of water logically, but it's not out of the realm of possibility of somebody like that. Somebody like Lilia would believe that would work, you know, because she is just so innocent and precious. So, okay. Yeah, I could see that actually. Um, so yeah. And, and the, the guard himself for his part, he is the one that, you know, was bringing her the books and was sort of in, in charge of managing her needs. It sounds really sexual when I say it like that, but you know what I mean? Um, but he was the one that was in the most contact with her and they all 
sort of imply that maybe his men are lying because all of them claim they never saw anything. And they also claim they didn't fall asleep. They weren't drinking. There was nothing that could have led to them being distracted. They were all on their top performance, like always. And everyone's like, "Mm." I mean, they, they got out. Somebody has to be fucking not being entirely truthful. And he says that these are some of the only honest men in the world, that he trusts them implicitly, and that several of them have offered their resignations and he's had to try to like convince them not to leave because they are so ashamed of the fact that this has happened. And I rather liked that, you know, these guys just being like, well, I don't know how it happened, but I'm not going to stand here and argue it's not my fault because this is my whole job is to be a guard and they are out. They have gotten away. So clearly I am not good at this and should be replaced. And I feel like that is a real indication of genuine honesty, them being so willing to take responsibility, even though they know that they did everything that was expected of them. They still feel like, well, clearly that wasn't enough. So obviously you need to get somebody who is going to be better at this. It's just a shame because they don't know that she has magic back, so they don't look for the kinds of escapes that she would be able to perform as a magician. It's mentioned later when she's like describing the way that they got away. One of the guards is constantly looking down at the tree line and at the forest because if you are expecting somebody to get help in escaping, they're going to come out of the trees. He glances up at the tower occasionally, but the tower is not going to be a viable means of escape for anybody who does not have magic. So he doesn't pay as much attention to it. Of course, the sort of theory that they wind up coming up with just in terms of getting out of the rooms is that there was only the one lock on each door and Lilia probably picked the locks. They don't, they're all sort of like, we didn't know she could pick locks. That's a very specific skill, but maybe. And, They acknowledge that maybe there should have been multiple locks on the doors in order to slow her down. Um, Just overall, I, I really liked all of them sort of theorizing and trying to make sense out of this because they just don't have the information that they would need to make sense of anything. And, and also the captain says something about how uh, they are next to each other in their cells and that he thought they could keep each other company by like speaking through the wall and that that would be something that would be a kindness. You know, they were told to treat these women well, they are prisoners, but they're not meant to be tortured or mistreated. So they specifically housed them in adjoining rooms as a service so that they would have somebody to talk to. And now they're realizing, well, that was a fucking error. And you know, it sucks because if Lilia weren't influenced by Larandra, that would have been a kindness. If she were with somebody, if she were also in prison next to somebody like herself, they probably could have been able to keep one another some company. But because she was put next to somebody with the devious kind of mind Larandra has, it did not work out for them. Um, I just feel bad whenever people blame themselves for a thing that like, no, honestly, that was your fault. But you were trying to be kind and good. And it's like awful when that is repaid with this sort of behavior. You know, I hate to see somebody who was whose instinct is to be kind and generous be proven a bit of a sucker. And for them to doubtless the next time they're they're put in this position, they will likely be less kind and less generous based on what they have learned. And I just hate to see that, you know, it's just there's so few kind, generous people in the world. And you would like for them to, (laughs) you would like for them to be like the priest in uh, Les Miserables when Jean Valjean gets caught stealing the silverware And the police bring him back to the priest's house and say, is this the man who stole the silver? And he says, no, 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 I gave him the silver. And you forgot to take the candlesticks and gives him an additional thing. That's what we all want out of humanity. But it's just not how we are. You know, if you let somebody into your home to be 
good to them and they repay you by stealing your shit, I think almost none of us would ever react that way. We would all be like, what the fuck, man? I was trying to be nice. Fuck you. Take him away. All of us would really be like that. And I constantly think about that moment in that particular script because for me, when I first saw that, I didn't even watch the like the first time I ever saw Les Mis, I watched the Liam Neeson movie, which is not a musical and I think better for it. But that scene affected me so deeply that priest like giving him the candlesticks and being like, go ahead, man, go make your way in the world. And that being like the turning point for him realizing that he like needs to do better. And I just it made such an impression on me but it's the kind of thing that i don't think i will ever be able to live up to you know it's this ideal um anyway okay so they decide that they are going to the, the other thing is lady venara um let's see ashley says that scene is brilliant i haven't made it through the full thing because adhd but the start is really good oh the liam neeson movie i really like that movie like uh, Les Mis is not I mean I just don't like musicals that much guys I'll be honest but that I think that movie gets to the heart of the actual like story very well um so v Lady Venara is sort of realizing like because people are out here being like oh we think we have information on what happened to this girl um and everybody's like what how did you find out about this and Osin's like, I bet somebody just let it slip, but we really can't worry about that right now. We have to take the information that's coming into us. Like, we need people to turn in their info so we can't argue about how they know. And this is when they get the, uh, we saw two women climbing over a wall thing. There's a moment here that I find really interesting. Um, Osin says, we have one small gleam of hope left to us. Unless Skellen sent Lilia and Lorandra on alone after he freed them, they weren't in his company. Working out how they escaped the lookout is not as important as finding them before they joined Skellen. He looked at Callan. That is your task. Find them. Osin turned to Sonia. As always, yours is Skellen. Find him. <laughs> it says... This was not a time for raising doubts by protesting that if it was as simple as that, she'd have caught Skellen already, or for showing any resentment at Osin ordering her about like a mindless soldier. She turned and strode for the door. I am a mindless soldier as far as the guild is concerned, she thought sourly as she entered the corridor. That is why they allowed me to stay. I'm their black magician to be sent out to fight on their behalf, and they'd much rather I did what I was told than suggest how things should be done. Well, they will have to accept that sometimes I will do things my way if they want me to risk my life to save theirs. That's an interesting moment. I didn't expect her reaction to be so resentful and sour. Uh, I, I kind of thought she was just going to be like, well, yeah, obviously I got to go find Kellen or Skellen. Um, I'm not I, I don't disagree with her because she's clearly right. Like they are ordering her around as a means of asserting control over a person that they are aware they really can't control if she decides to do what she feels like. And I just don't really know what to say about that. There's a big part of me that feels like the tide is turning here. This black magic is going to begin to be the thing. I mean, we've already got Lorcan about to learn it. We have Lilia out here knowing it and potentially being able to teach it to somebody else. Like if she's put in the position where she has to, I just, uh, I don't really, I don't know. It's, it's the sort of like fighting against the inevitable thing that happens when you get really, what's the word for, for not wanting to change? Maybe like insular also, because there's other ways of using magic and the Karelians basically look at it as, as black magic can make you too powerful. And we have that historical data from, you know, several books ago, the description of that one guy who took down all of the, almost all of the guild, all of the magicians and like a great deal of innocent people in the countryside 
because he went on a rampage stealing power from people. The thing is, though, like, if he, if everybody knew how to use it, maybe they wouldn't have such a wild advantage. And I just think that this sort of all or nothing thinking never really works out. Like, it's a, it's similar to prohibition in a way. Being like, well, you know, alcohol is dangerous and it can lead to things. Well, yeah, it can. So can literally anything. You've got to manage it. And you've also got to be prepared for things to go left because that is how life works. And obviously there is so much that they don't know about black magic because they don't practice it. And so they're all like... They are open on every side to somebody sneak attacking them in various ways because they're not ready because they haven't explored it and researched it at all. So this whole thing with like Lilia being able to unblock her her magic, they maybe they would have been fucking aware of that if they weren't so anti black magic. Maybe they would have been prepared for the, you know, Sunia and Akarin are the ones that stand against this uh, Ichani invasion because they're the only ones who know how to use it. And then we have Lilia learning it out of a book when all of them were like, oh, you can't learn it from a book. There's no reason to even worry about it. You can't do it. Well, apparently you fucking can. There's just so much that they just keep like they have this arrogance about thinking that they know a thing, but they have refused to explore an entire branch of magic that is very openly used by other countries, obviously, freely. Guys, you're just hobbling yourselves. Like, that's that's extremely short-sighted and foolish and honestly a little bit cowardly, just being like, well, you know, it went bad that one time. Well, yeah, I mean, shit's going to go bad. Bad people are out there. What are you going to do? So I, there are, in a lot of ways, I feel like the guild is just antiquated at this point. I, I really understand wanting to make everybody get an education if they have magic. I really understand the impulse to do that. But limiting them as well is not smart. That is just going to like if black magic were seen as an unthinkable thing by every other country around you then maybe i could understand not practicing or allowing the study of it even then i would think that would be like probably not a good policy but i could i could see it but when you are directly neighbored by a country who is freely using this kind of magic and they recently attempted a coup. Guys, just having Callan and Sunia be the only ones who can perform this is, I'm sorry, that is not smart. It's just not. So anyway, we're going to move on. But I just, I, I feel like it is inevitable that Kirelia is going to have to catch the fuck up with everybody else. I don't know. I I think that that is something that is like on the horizon and they're going to have to figure out the management of it because they just can't keep this up and still be a power in the world, you know? Um, So Ashley says, it kind of strikes me as being similar to banning thing, the research of things like cannabis based on limited knowledge. Yeah. Like if, if people are, this is the sort of thing of like legalizing weed. People are going to smoke weed. It's the same thing as prohibition. People were going to drink. You're just making this like weird underground, very dangerous market for it rather than making it regulated and managed. I feel the same way about sex work. You know, people are going to pay for sex. That is just the like they call it the oldest profession for a reason. That is just always going to be in demand. Make sure that people are safe. Manage the way it works. Give people recourse if something goes wrong or if they are hurt. Don't make the people who are you know, providing a service that is their choice to provide be the the enemy and the people who are penalized for things. Um, anyway, Martin says, I also think it's a bit of an oversight to send her against Skellen who could potentially have black magic without strengthening herself. Yeah, I guess that they're just banking on the fact that Skellen doesn't have black magic. But I mean, Again, there's just not a good reason to bank on anything. I I guess the assumption is that if she finds him, she doesn't confront him. But that's all 
operating under the assumption that she gets the drop on him rather than him getting the drop on her. And I can also see them not really wanting to give her strength without knowing for sure it's going to be necessary because that sets the precedent that she's going to start doing this. And they are obviously super fucking gun shy about that. So yeah, that makes sense to me, honestly, because they are very short sighted. What can you say? Um, so let's see. Oh, right. Dorian, this conversation, man. Um, we're gonna because that actually that conversation happens a little bit later dorian shows up to pick her up and uh help her meet up with sari and we go back to them later um so let let me go to daniel achadi and tyand and i mean we know that the part that i really want to talk about is the bathhouse but i guess let's talk about this record that he reads it's basically a diary um Let's see. Achadi says, uh, Ashaki Nakaro gave me this last night. He said we might find something useful in it about the Duna. And it is a record of this like invading force, this colonizing force, meeting the Duna and d- determining what kind of threat they are or what kind of deal can be made. And it's honestly like incredibly upsetting to read because it's just so very like the Spanish arriving in the United States and just decimating the fucking native population. It's just, you know, um, so basically the whole thing is that the Duna do not see the land as ownable the same way that they do not see people as ownable. And when they ask, like, so whose land is this? The Duna respond, oh, well, I mean, it's like everybody's, I don't know, doesn't belong to anyone. What do you mean? And they say, so does it also belong to us the same way? And they're like, yeah, I mean, I guess. And they're like, okay, cool. And then they just shove them all off of this land and take it over because... Of course they fucking do. Um, and the whole, like, it, this makes it a lot clearer how this was possible. This, like, you know, this takeover. But it's also frustrating because the very thing that leads Duna to being what it is means that they are kind of unable to fight back the way that they should like you know what I mean it's it's the same thing any peaceful nation who values conversation and the good of the majority and communication is going to be overcome by a violent as long as they are like slightly outnumbered or at equal numbers, they are going to be overpowered by the other, the opposing force. That's just how it fucking works. And it's fucking horrifying. Honestly, when you think about it, that that is the record that humanity has set is that, Oh, you know, caring about the common good and doing what's right for everybody involved. That is a losing prospect. Most of the time. But it sort of is, unless you manage to make yourself otherwise unappealing to to conquer your lands unappealing. How do you do that, you know? Um, or you make yourself small enough to not really seem super significant. Like uh, Costa Rica, for example, has no standing army. They have invested almost all of that money into education. And that is why their basic infrastructure and society is going pretty fucking well. But they are vulnerable. The thing is, nobody really cares. Nobody's attacking them because they're so small and sort of insignificant in their way. How do you manage to do that? It's a very tricky little formula to get right, you know? Um, So let's see. After much confusion and mistranslation, it became clear that nobody knew who the keepers were. This was very frustrating. 
As Daniel read on, he was heartened to see that Haniva had attempted to negotiate a peaceful acquisition of the land. There was This was no brutal conquest yet. Haniva tried many times and different approaches, but though the Duna appeared to be cooperative and amenable to the idea of selling, there was no clear owner of the land. Um, and it, the Duna's way of thinking would not have been particularly practical if their land had not been so difficult to live on. As Daniel worked his way through the diary, he learned that Haniva and his Ashaki partners eventually gave up on gaining any official documents stating they'd bought the land, drove out the Duna, and settled. By the end of the record, there were already signs that crops were not growing as hoped. So the Duna, it's like be, making their land unappealing. I mean, they didn't have to do anything. It's just sort of worked out that way. But that's maybe going to be like one of the few things that allows them to continue to exist as a people. If that, if that, if it weren't for that, if they were living on extremely fertile land, I bet they, the Duna are gone by now in the timeline. You know, I bet that's just done. Um, so let's jump ahead a little bit. Uh, Daniel, Achadi asks Daniel about meeting with them and talking with them. And Daniel's basically like, all right, look, I'm down. But I also low key want to talk to them by myself. Would that offend you? And Achadi says no. And Daniel says, okay, but what if I also don't promise to tell you everything that they tell me? Will that be a problem? And Achadi gets a little bit salty, but he's like, all right, look, I guess like he's just like, I want us to be allies. But in the end, we each are loyal to our own country. And in the in most cases, what threatens Sachaka also threatens Kirelia and vice versa. So I'm going to trust that if you choose not to tell me something, it will likely be to my benefit also. But, you know, I am just, I'm going to, I'm going to be courteous. Just don't be a dick about it. And Achadi at one point is like, oh, BT dubs. If my king were to ask me to kill you, I would absolutely do that. No hesitation. And Daniel later is like, so no hesitation. And I really like it. Like Daniel even thinks about himself in that position and is kind of like, oh, maybe I would too. I guess I would. I mean, when it comes right down to it, that's a fucked up thing to think about. But I suppose when he puts it like that and I really think about where my loyalty is, yeah, I would also. It would suck and I would hate it, but I would do it. And Achadi, when he's like, no hesitation, Chadi's like, all right, well, maybe I'd hesitate a little bit, but like, I would do it. And to his credit, Daniel's reaction is mostly, oh, it's kind of hot, which I find so relatable. <laughs> there is nothing like throwing in a little bit of danger, a little bit of a feeling of like, oh, maybe this isn't a good idea to make it just so much more exciting and interesting and attractive. And I don't feel like Daniel has been this relatable ever. Like that, that reaction to him saying that is just, yep, I get it, buddy. I really do. <laughs> um, so then we go to Lilia and it starts with Lilia had no idea where she was, which is precisely what the fuck I expected. I just assume Lorandra uses Lilia to get the fuck out of there and then totally takes the reins and Lilia has no fucking clue because of course she doesn't. What is she going to do? You know, she's like a Loey in quotes. And if she were a regular Loey, I feel like she would have a better time, but she's not, she's like the upper tier. You know, this is like, this is like somebody upper middle class trying to sort of mix it up in the hood and just precious sweet baby. No, you know, she's, just doesn't know how to talk to people. She doesn't know what to expect. She doesn't, she's not prepared for like the violence and the crime uh, and keeps on having to sort of like remind herself that 
things are going to be desperate for a bit. And when she finds out that Larandra knows these people, it clearly puts Larandra in a whole different light. Because I think Lilia never really says it, but I think that Lilia sort of expected that maybe Larandra wasn't the threat that she is perceived to be. You know, she's an older woman. Her powers are blocked and it. she isn't a black magician who can get around that. And I think that she's a sort of saw Larandra as needing her help and not that she wasn't going to have any sort of advantage. And then to go into this underbelly and realize that not only does Larandra know people, but they lo- really respect her. They like kneel and shit, you know, not like literally, but it's the sort of thing where if that were the tradition, that would be what was happening. They all kowtow to her a bit. And at one point there's some dude who's like leering at Lilia. And when Larandra comes around the corner and he realizes Larandra is with Lilia, he's like, oh, fuck, and just immediately backs off and gets really pale and looks like he was about to have fucked up big time. And uh, the men who, like, they meet up with are really nice to her and give her bread and, like, you know, beer, basically. Um, And... She, they meet up with this dude. I, and this is not Skellen, I don't think, is it? Um, do, do, do. Let's see. Lilia looked up, noting that the room's decoration and furniture were expensive. She heard her name and realized that the man sitting opposite her, watching her with narrowed eyes, was very well dressed indeed. She, he's not Skellen because they're planning on introducing her to Skellen, and that's like the big deal. I wonder if this dude is somebody that we've met before. I don't think so. Because there's no particular description of his face or anything like this. Um, Ashley says, yeah, I'm re-listening to the A Song of Ice and Fire podcast and you had the same reaction to, I think it was Drogo. Girl, there is nothing I like better than a dude that I know could throw me over his shoulders and just drag me away. And I know that this is a deeply problematic place to be, but that's where I live. Like, this is part of why I enjoyed watching uh, Vikings so much. Like, those dudes are just so brutal and it is the biggest turn on and they are just covered in blood half the time and just ready for death at any moment. And it's just, it's hot, man. It just is, you know? And like, do I want to be with a person like that? No, obviously not. That is just not a way to live. But... You know, I'm not averse to, like, the concept of it, like, for a night or two. It's fine. Just saying. So, at this point, he mentions that the sun is up, and Lily is like, wait, what? <sighs> I I do appreciate that when it comes right down to it, Larandra's like, do you want to go back? And she lets Lily, she doesn't say, we're not going back, you idiot. She lets Lily come to the conclusion herself because she knows what Lily is going to choose to do. But it is so frustrating. Like, <sighs> she came out here really thinking that Larandra was going to be like, yeah, go back. Like, I mean, I guess Larandra's out. If Lilia wants to go back, what does she care, really? It's an advantage to her to have Lilia to present to Skellen so that he can learn ba- black magic, for sure. Like, this is a good prize to deliver. But if she doesn't have it, she's still free. And that's a pretty good fucking situation. So, you know, maybe she doesn't really care in the end. Um, And LaRondra tells her, we'll find Naki. They'll forgive you for running away when you bring her back to them. Which is a really interesting point that I hadn't considered. The idea that Naki is missing and if Lilia brings her back I don't think they'll forgive her I mean obviously the Rondra's just saying that to make Lilia feel better but I would be really curious what their reaction would be especially because I expect when Lilia catches up to Naki it is going to be a ugly scene I don't know what it would have to look like but I assume anything that she <laughs> I know I'm making a major assumption here, but I feel like anything that she winds up doing, any any sort of like 
uh, position that she ends up in where she finds Naki. She's going to find Naki in a compromising sort of position. And I mean this not in the sexual way that it sounds like. I mean, it's going to be, I think, a revealing situation that lets her realize that Naki is not who she thought. Now, that might not be true. Maybe she run, like finds Naki and try. I mean, for all I know, I'm not even right. And Naki did not set her up. I think it's very clear that she did. But maybe she didn't. But my assumption is that she catches up with Naki and it's just going to be obvious all of a sudden. Oh, my God, I was so wrong. Either what she catches Naki doing or where Naki is or... Maybe she catches Naki like in the middle of doing black magic and realizes she lied about not being able to do that. And then the pieces fall into place or Naki's reaction to seeing Lilia is not what Lilia would want. And the problem with that one is that Lilia assumes Naki hates her anyway, because Lilia thinks that Naki really believes she killed her dad. So I don't know what Lilia is expecting in terms of a reception, but my whole thing is just, I feel Lilia's innocence here can only go on so long. So let's say that's true. Let's say she catches up to Naki. It's immediately clear that Naki is full of shit. And she's like, oh my God, I done fucked up and I need to like fix this. Does that mean that Lilia turns around and tries to turn Naki in? I don't think so. Like, I think it depends on what she finds Naki doing or discovers Naki's been doing. If Naki proves to be a threat or a danger to other people, if there's something to indicate that, then I think Lilia would feel obligated to in a way. But Lilia's in love with her. Whether or not Naki feels the same way about her is not really relevant. Lilia loves her. And that is a really powerful motivating factor in covering for somebody. I mean, how many people their partner commits a murder and that person helps the partner cover it up. Like that's just, even if they weren't involved in the murder, even though th- that is still something that is just, you know, a, whether that's a romantic partner, a brother or sister, a parent, if you care about a person who did something, even if they did a bad thing and you don't agree with what they did, oftentimes your loyalty to them will supersede your loyalty to the right thing. So I feel like it's going to have to be pretty extreme to get Lilia to turn on Naki at all. And therefore, that will put Lilia in an even worse situation because she will not only have escaped and be in possession of her powers again, which leads to her being expendable to the, you know, the, the guild is going to have to execute her if they want to punish her. But she will look like she's like kind of a... An, uh, accessory probably to whatever it is that Naki did. I wonder if just the virtue of whatever is revealed, if the guild realizes that Naki set Lilia up, if they are going to be willing to overlook everything. But I mean, I don't know how forgiving they can be after they already like tried to block her power and lock her up and she escaped and did this whole thing. You know, they, they forgave Sunia because she fought on their behalf and it was like they were in such a desperate situation, but it's not, that's not going to be the case with Lilia. So I'm just really, honestly, Lilia is such a sweet little child that doesn't know any better in a lot of ways. I'm starting to be convinced that like there is not going to be any other way for shit to turn out for her other than to be executed. I just don't know how they come to any alternative conclusion unless they decide to finally embrace black magic, which might be the only option. And that is such a dramatic shift in a whole, like the whole, I just don't know if they can manage that. That's a huge, huge change in mentality for the whole guild, you know? Um, so I'm trying to go a little bit like uh, I've talked about so much here. Um, Oh, okay. So let's talk about Lorcan and the sentencing. 
um, because he goes to see uh, what is her name? Kalia's sentencing. Um, the thing with Kalia is really frustrating because Lorcan is absolutely correct. They are delaying what he thinks is inevitable. They are not going to banish her. They are not going to kill her. They are not going to do anything other than basically like strip her of her titles and her duty. And she is a deeply dangerous person. And I just don't know that this is going to work out for him. Like she's still going to be out there and she's still going to have her supporters. And I guess she's kind of gotten what she wanted out of him. And so killing him at this point, maybe there's not really any reason for it, but that doesn't really necessarily factor into anything, whether there's a reason or not. I could see him still just being seen as the enemy and the reason that she's like lost everything and being a target anyway. Um, and she straight up admits to everything that she did. She's like, yeah, I did, uh, abduct him and they, let's see, is Lorcan's account true? Um, are you guilty of abduction and reading a traitor's mind against his or her will? And Riaya says, then there's no need to investigate the matter further. And Kalia asks if she can make a speech. And she says something about how basically he's doing this magic and we don't know anything about it. We don't know if it's even safe. We don't know if he's doing harm rather than good. He claims that there are limitations to it, but we don't even know that for a fact because we're not familiar with this magic. We just don't know anything. And he's keeping this from us. And I did this for the good of all of us. And I have tried to be kind and give him um, occupation and taught him from, you know, what I know, I've given him all of the advantages of the education of what I know to do. And he is refusing to listen to me in like my restricting him from using his healing magic without guidance or permission. He flouted my rules. And I don't believe if he does that, that he gets to be considered a traitor and therefore be under the same kind of protection, legally speaking, that the rest of you would be. And honestly, it's the sort of thing that sounds good, but we know that Kalia doesn't actually give a fuck about anybody. She's just trying to leverage him and has been since day one to make him look bad so that she can get the information she wants. Not necessarily because that's good for everybody, but because she just wants power. I really believe that it's not about wanting to heal people. I think that she wants to like get one up on him. And I feel like she's just angry and bitter. And I don't know that that would change even if he gave her the knowledge that she's seeking. I feel like, you know, so then Savara stands up and Savara's like, look, let's set aside all of what she said and just look at the fact that she has gone and forcibly read the mind of somebody from Kirelia. She has basically committed an act of war. This is something that could incite shit with not only Sachaka, but all of the other Kirelian allies out there. And so she may have put us in a position where we are going to wind up having to like fucking defend ourselves against a variety of forces rather than just Sachaka, who we've been hiding from up till now. And also put yourself in his shoes. And he came in here and accepted the risk of being kept here against his will in order to stand up for one of our kind. And we expect him to just give up all of his secrets. Would any of us be prepared to simply do that? Were we taken by another country? No, none of us would have done any differently than him. And the expectation that we respect the like privacy of his mind is the least that should be expected of us. Um, and this is an unlawful act of one nation against another. She has stolen secrets from Kiralia, not just his head. 
He wasn't turning over that information because he knows how the guild would react and that this is strictly against their rules. He, this is not him just being stubborn. He is trying to respect what is expected of him due to his previous loyalties. And this is something that could really put us in fucking hot water. So I think that you guys need to think outside of just what's good for us and us as a people and see the long game here. And that when you really look at the big picture, this could have put us all in a lot of fucking danger and not have wound up being worth it in the end. And I think that she was very persuasive. I appreciated her so much. Um, so yeah, then, uh, they do the sentencing, strip her of her leadership or she can't use healing magic unless she's ordered to. Um, and he th thinks to himself, oh, okay. So they're going to make her look bad for a temper. Like they're going to make it look like they are punishing her just enough for just long enough that eventually she'll be allowed to use the knowledge after like a, a decent interval has passed and it's just going to turn into her teaching other people and basically the jig is up. Um, and he's sort of realizing that maybe this was the plan all along that they just knew at some point if they like, they could give him some time to try and give it up freely. But if he seemed clearly not on the path to do that, they could just force it out of his head and then make a show of punishing the person who did it. But they have the knowledge now. And really, what else is there to be done? The only thing that could set them back at square one is Kalia being executed or somebody killing her. That's it. Because she's the only one who has it in her head. And I mean, I don't see that happening. Um, however, the queen does do something pretty significant in return. And she tells Lorcan that in compensation... They are going to teach him the art of stone making. And his reaction initially is like, oh shit, they are going to fucking love that in Kiralia. And then he has to stop and be like, ooh, but I don't know if I'm ever going to go back there. And like, if I do, I'm going to have to leave Tyvara here. And I don't, mm. And later on, the queen asks her whether or not he is like, cause he says something. I, I there, there's a phrasing of a question um, where she asks him whether or not he is willing to learn black magic. And he sort of like responds with a, like, well, we don't da da da. And she's like, we or you like, she's sort of, he thinks pressing to see if he still feels a loyalty to Kirelia over the traitors. And it turns out that's not actually like she's trying to suss out whether or not he's willing to learn black magic because he has to learn it in order to be able to do the stone making. So I, I, but you know, there might be two meanings to that question. Um, and we don't see that process. We don't see him learning that, but that is where things sort of end with him is knowing that that's in his future. Um, I only have a couple minutes left, so I'm going to be pretty quick. But we have, first of all, I should mention Dorian talking to Sunia and saying that he sometimes regrets marrying his wife, which is a fucking hell of a thing to say to an ex-girlfriend. Like, look, Dorian, I understand the position that you're in with not being happy. But don't do this, dude. I don't know what you're trying to do, but it feels like you're really trying to like lay the groundwork for maybe I will leave my wife for you. And I don't get any sort of indication from Sunia that she's interested. I don't know if you were trying to suss that out here with this conversation, but just like, mm -mm. and then there's this whole thing with Larandra and she is telling like, she has to sort of like leverage Lilia and Lilia gets approached by this other girl who I think most of us knew it was Anya right away. Anya is just like, dude, she's not introducing you to Skellen because she's trying to help you. She's introducing you to him because he wants to know how to do black magic. And you know, 
and he is going to demand in exchange for whatever it is that you want that you teach him that. And at first, Lily is like, well, I'll just tell him I won't teach him unless I get my girlfriend back. And Anya's like, yeah, do you really think that that's like going to work? You don't think that he could just like maybe go in your head and take that knowledge or whatever? Maybe you just don't want to be in that position at all. How about that? I will help you get out of here. And thank the Lord, Lilia accepts the offer. I was really worried that she was just going to be like, no, no, I trust Larandra. Thank God. She's just like, yeah, okay. This whole thing feels real hinky. I'm going to get out of here. And Anya helps her. Anya doesn't realize that Lilia does have her powers back. Apparently, Larandra has said so, but Anya didn't think it was true. And at one point, Lilia assists with levitation to get them out of there. And uh, Anya's like, oh, shit, you do have your power back. And I am real curious what's going to happen between them. Like, first of all, I think I sense a tiny bit of chemistry. And I'm hoping that Anya can take Naki's place in Lilia's heart. Fingers crossed. But setting that all aside, I am really curious what Sunny is going to do if Lilia turns up because he, she is perfect bait for Skellen, you know, like, but she also has her loyalties to the guild, but catching Skellen is in service to the guild. We'll see. Um, so yeah. Uh, oh, I didn't get a chance. I'm so sorry, guys. I didn't get a chance to talk about Daniel and Achati in the bathhouse, but my assumption that Ty and cock blocked, Lur came in order to cock block seems 100% correct. They were about to kiss and Tyan suddenly like, hey, guys, I'm here to go into the bath. Oh, God. Honestly, though, Tyan, I kind of love you. Like, it's so transparent and it's really funny. So I am. I am eager to see where that goes. Personally, I kind of want Tyan and Daniel to work it out, but I'm not married to that idea. Uh, Martin says, do you think Anya will turn Lilia into Sunia or hide her with Sari? I think if she hides her with Sari, Sari is going to tell Sunia. So I think they both equal the same thing. Um, anyway, okay. I really have to go on overtime. But thank you guys very much for hanging out with me. Thank you again to Ashley for commissioning this episode and commissioning a bunch of others today. And I will... Oh, Ashley says the next boy me isn't until September. Oh, no. Oh, well, what can you do? Shit happens. But thank you guys, and I'll see you eventually with a new episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.